My name is Martin Dreiling. I'm located here at uh, LMU, which is uh, is the major university here in Munich, uh, Germany. And I do have the privilege that I'm the founder and chairman of the European MCL Network, which is around already uh, 24 years. We had our first meeting around 2000. And at that time, there was no standard of care in Montessor lymphoma. We only knew that it's uh, difficult to diagnose, that it's difficult to treat. And since then, we really you know, made some major steps forward, identifying the heterogeneity of Montessor lymphoma, also identifying the underlying biology and the parameters which can uh, are nowadays being applied in clinical routine and finally we have also improved treatment of our patients so far i think a uh, standard of care has been still an anti cd20 antibody in combination with conventional chemotherapy what we have learned during the last let's say um uh, 10 years or so is that we had significantly improved um, the outcome of the patients by adding rituximab maintenance. So this is not only improving progression-free survival, but also overall survival. And uh, this is not only um, statistically significant, but also clinically relevant. So in the range of 10 to 20% overall survival benefit after five years. So therefore, this represents the current standard of care, R chemo followed by R maintenance. In the triangle trial, I, I show we focused on the younger patients. So on one hand, these are always patients with a more favorable prognostic score. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what we also learned during the last decades that dose intensification does improve long-term outcome. So essentially, the current standard of care is cytarabine containing induction, autologous stem cell transplant, and finally, as mentioned, rituximab maintenance. We also knew that uh, the most powerful salvage treatment in relapsed mantle cell lymphoma are BTKI, protons, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and therefore we introduced these BTKIs into first-line treatment of patients. Having said that, there's a little bit uh, um, bizarre uh, um, consolation that way in U.S., the second generation BTKIs are uh, the only ones which are currently registered, namely acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib. In Europe, it's only the first generation BTKI ibrutinib. So we, we compared the old standard to two new standards. One was an add-on de uh, design, so autologous transplant plus ibrutinib in induction and maintenance. Uh, and the second experiment mental arm was in fact substituting autologous transplant by ibrutinib, so reducing chemotherapy. And now we have, uh, with a follow-up of almost five years, solid data, as expected, the add-on design resulted in a significantly improved modified progression-free survival, and the difference is quite uh, relevant, uh, about 12% after four years. Now, interestingly, this is also the case for the head-to-head -head comparison, ibrutinib instead of autologous transplant. And therefore, at least in Europe, based on these data, uh, you, one has to say, Ibrutinib is meanwhile mandatory for first-line treatment of younger patients with mantle cell lymphoma. And these data are also fostered by the data on overall survival. And again, here we have around plus 10% uh, um, of overall survival improvement after four years. The good message for the patients is that for the vast majority, 90% of patients, we don't need autologous transplant anymore. So uh, the new standard of care, which is conventional chemotherapy plus ibrutinib, 
is not only more efficient, but it's also better tolerated. And for uh, the doctors is um, that you don't uh, have to, to plan the autologous transplant ahead of time, because that also frequently means to transfer patients to larger centers who, are, who usually are performing the autologous stem cell transplant. All this is no more necessary. Having said that, there is still an open question, and then the open uh, this open question is the very high risk patients, and that's based on biological risk factors, namely um, high cell proliferation, blastoid cytomorphology, or p53 alterations. And in this subset, um, one may individually still consider to add autologous to ibrutinib. Content-wise, I think it's important to understand that if you do autologous transplant in these very high-risk patients, there's still a price to pay, and the price to pay is toxicity. So we have seen that if you have the triple combination, autologous transplant followed by rituximab and ibrutinib uh, maintenance, there's an increased uh, toxicity, and therefore this remains an individual decision, first of all. And secondly, I think our data show that there is really academic independent trials are important to further improve our treatment strategies uh, in our patients. And uh, I think now as we are working more than 20 years on this rather rare kind of disease, we definitely push the wagon and have now a much more improved uh, treatment strategies. I said we were starting with no standard of care around 2000. Now the median PFS in these younger patients is probably beyond 10 years. So that's quite a success. And even in relapse, we have effective salvage treatments.